the next slide. So this pro uh, this little talks about prop uh, property valuation, but uh, more specifically, just about uh, how to value HMOs uh, properly. Um, so very quickly about me, I don't like talking about myself too much, um, but I know it's it's common for for these things. Um, so graduated in 2008 from Sheffield Hallam University in business property management, which is basically, it's a surveying course. It's not a business course. Um, everyone on my course was well, aiming to be you know, uh, chartered surveyors. Um, became a chartered surveyor in 2010, so I passed, uh, passed my assessment. Um, I then qualified last year as a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, uh, which means that that's basically doing dispute resolution uh, work for commercial properties. Um, and what I spend my days doing now, I do spend my day, a lot, of my, most of my days now I spend doing property development, um, mainly doing industrial, uh, industrial estates. Uh, but I, I do, I do also keep a hand in, in doing property valuations for mainly for banks, uh, but then also dispute work for some things like probates and, uh, divorces, things like that. Um, and then also doing the arbitration work, uh, which is obviously quite a bit more lucrative. Uh, it's been a bit more specialised. Um, so that's me in a whistle stop tour. So about this, we'll do a quick overview of the Red Book, um, overview of general valuation principles, overview of HMO valuations, um, ask questions as we go. Uh, no such thing as a, there's no such thing as a daft question. Honestly, I will have probably asked it um, you know, multiple times before, um, so don't worry. Some things we won't be doing, waving in photos or jazz hands, not happening today. If you want to go and do some star jumps outside, you crack on, um, do, your, do, you know, do, do your waves and what have you, that's not, for, that's not for today. No whooping, no raising alternative hands whilst answering rhetorical questions or hashtagging. Okay, so, Introduction to the Red Book. Um, can everyone hear me okay, by the way, just as a, just before we get into it? Yes, yeah, it's spot on. Yeah, okay, super duper. Right, so the Red Book. Official name, RICS Valuation Global Standards. Um, it is effectively the, val the, the valuers, chart surveyors Bible. That tells us, it doesn't tell us how to value properties, but it's the standard to which we have to do all reports um, it talks about things like ethics within valuations, um, all the terms of business that we have to that we have to adhere to, um, and it's it's very comprehensive. It's a good five or six hundred pages long, um, and it covers uh, it's it's a it's a worldwide uh, regulatory sort of gl global standards as as it says in there in the title. Um, basically, we have we have to follow it. Um, so. Thing, doing things like um, you know verbal valuations that's a big no-no um, all reports according to the red book have to be written in you know written down um, either in paper or obviously now in, in you know in more more usually in PDF format um, so get asking a asking a chart surveyor to do you a verbal valuation um, that you know they really really shouldn't be doing that um, unless, unless it's for agency work um, which is excluded from uh, excluded from the red book but in terms of formal valuations um, a report has to be has to be written uh, and that's a nice little front that's the, the front cover um, of the global standards it covers things like the market value definition which is there so when people talk about how what, what's the value of the property you know and, and people say, oh, well, it's how much somebody would be willing to pay for it, or there's, there's all sorts of crazy stuff that goes flying around on, on the Facebook groups and what have you. That's, that there is the, def, is the definition that, you have to, that we have to work, work to as chartered surveyors. Okay. So, for example, if a property has been sold within a 30-day period, for example, and it's not... If, if a normal marketing period should have been, say, 90 days, then that hasn't sold for market value, which is a big thing when you're doing your comparables, okay? 
So if you've got a, a big industrial estate, so, you know, that, that's the sort of the, the type of properties that I'm buying and, and, and renovating now. If somebody sold an industrial estate via an auction and it only had 30, you know, obviously you've only got 30 days to complete on that. So you, you, know, you might have 45, maybe 50 days, including, <coughs> apologies, um, including the marketing period. That's probably not an adequate length of, of marketing. So if it's, you, know, you read there, it says after proper marketing. So if you know of a, of a property that's sold where it hasn't had proper marketing and a chartered surveyor uses that as a comparable, then you can say, aha, no, this, that property didn't have proper marketing for one reason or another than you. Know. Um, and again, may, maybe um, you knew of a seller who was under financial stress and needed to sell, sell his property quickly. Well, that then is, that, that seller would have been selling with compulsion, i.e. he needed to sell, and therefore that, that comparable wouldn't have met the definition of market value, I, because the, the seller would have had to sell with compulsion. He needed to sell, he was compelled to sell. And therefore, if you're in a position where you're getting a valuation done, and, the, and the, the comparables that are being put forward by the valuer from the bank, and you know about one of the comparables, you can, you can get in there early and say, you know, don't look at that property three doors down because I know it looks like it's sold for a cheap price, which obviously will then affect my valuation. But the story behind it is it sold for... Yeah, it sold because you know because the seller was under under financial stress, and he, and the valuer may say, well, mmm, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. And but then you can say, ah, yes, but it does, because now it doesn't meet the the value the definition of market value, and therefore it's not a not a reasonable comparable to put into the into the mix. Okay. Any questions there? No, I mean, I'll, um, if people put them in the chat box, I'll just read them when there's a... Well, can I just do a quick one, Ryan? So what would... Um, thank you for doing this, by the way. The What would be the definition of proper marketing? Is there like a, a minimum time period? Does it have to be up with an agent or...? Again, because because this... Uh, the, the, the Red Book, the RICS Valuation Global Standards, is written for a whole host of different... So uh, the, this covers everything from arts and antiques to machine plant, machine plants, that sort of stuff, to residential property, commercial property, um, you know, uh, shopping centres. Um, it, it's appropriate for that for that asset. Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, selling a, a you know a fifty pound gold chain via an auction, may you know, ten days may be reasonable. Yeah. Um, selling a shopping centre. Yeah. Three years very well may be reasonable. Fair enough. Um, it, it's it's horses for courses. There, there's no there's no number that you can definitively put your hand on and say, you know, it's three months for houses and and six months for industrial properties and you know nine months for retail. Um, it's it's a, it's what's appropriate. Um, so the, there are um, you know what what you can do is you can, you know if if you subscribe to Right Move Plus. You can have a, you can have a look at all the average marketing periods for houses in in any given area. You can you can do all your search criteria and all that sort of jazz, and you can say, well, you know, the average house within this quarter mile radius took fifty three days to market. You know, for, uh, you know, from from sort of hitting hitting right move to being sold to Dutch contract or or even completing. Um, and therefore, you know, 53 days then becomes the appropriate marketing period, give or take. So if, if you've got something that's way outside those parameters, then that's when you know that there's an, there's an, an anomaly for one reason or another. Perfect. Thanks so much, mate. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. So the different valuation methodologies... So the, f the first one and, and the most the most used because it does this this one does come in with some of the following methodologies is the comparable basis. This is mainly used for traditional residential houses. Okay, so you two up, two down, vanilla buy to lets, um, you know, or you know, your own personal residence. 
this more often than not, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time will be used on a comparable basis. That is literally saying, what does my house look like? And what is, what is it similar to? Okay, so if you've got a two bed mid terraced, what are other two bed mid terraces selling for that are in broadly the same condition? And you're going to have to make it, you know, the value has to make adjustments up and down, left and right, according to, you know, one's got gold taps, whereas one's in a fairly poor, poor state, habitable, but still in a poor state. Um, so that, that's, the, that's the main um, valuation methodology. The second uh, most regularly used is the investment basis. Okay, so this is used for large HMOs uh, and commercial properties, and this is a uh, what's commonly known as the um, uh, uh, as the sort of the, the investment or yield basis. So that's when you take you take a rent, uh, be it an, an estimated rental value if it's, if there's no rent passing, or the actual market rent, um, and multiply it by seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, whatever, um, to get to, you know, to, to get to your capital value. So that's the investment basis. The residual. So that's, this is uh, the development valuations. Um, residual basically means what's left. So it's the, it's the residue. Um, so that's when that, this is used for development sites. So you've got a piece of land, you start with your end, so you, you, you use your comparable basis. So you say you've got a, a develop plot, development plot for 10 houses. Each house is worth 100 grand when you finish, just for my small brain here, we'll, we'll work with easy numbers. Uh, so 10 houses, 100 grand, they, therefore your GDV is a million pound, your gross development value, and then you work it back. So you take off your development costs, you take off your developer's profit, you, you take off your uh, contingencies, your fees, et cetera, et cetera, and you're left with your residue. Okay, and that is effectively what you what you ought to be paying for a piece of land. Profits valuations. Uh, this is again this, these these ones are now you know they're becoming more and more specialist um, and, and more infrequently used. Um, so profits valuations used for pubs, nightclubs, cinemas, and restaurants. Um, and then the contractors method evaluation. Again, this is just for that one in a thousand properties universities, train stations, police stations, public building, you know, t town and council buildings, stuff that basically never actually exchanges on the open market, uh, but where uh, institutions need to get valuations done for, uh, for auditing purposes and for regulatory purposes. Um, so it's, it's, it's very, very seldom used except in extremely specialist circumstances. Um, so, what we're all here for, HMOs, houses in multiple occupation. So, as well as the, the red book, um, just excuse me one second. As well as the red book, the, all, the, the RICS also put out guidance notes and information papers. And the, um, so, like I said earlier, the, the, the red book doesn't actually tell us how to value properties. It just gives us a framework within which, within which to work. These, the, these guidance notes, notes and information papers are more technical, definite, you know, technical standards. And these do guide us through how to, uh, you know, how we ought to be approaching valuations using the methodologies that I've referred to earlier. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to take our knowledge and understanding of, of what methodologies are, are, are at least available to us and cross reference it with this. This is the important one. Now, this is downloadable, I believe, to members of the public. If you're interested in, in understanding HMO evaluations properly, I can't tell you all this in a day, even if I was to sit here all day. This is the piece, this is the information paper you need to download and wrap your head around. If you want to understand HMO valuations, you need to sit and study this basically. It's about 50 odd pages long, I think, from memory. Um, it's not very exciting, but it, it, it's, yeah, it, it just tells you everything you need to know and, and everything you need to, obviously I'm, I'm giving you a very brief pricey in, in this, uh, in this uh, presentation, but that's that's you know everything comes from this okay so th this is where you need to be um where you need to be sort of digesting your information from 
and this is what we have to work to as valuers again so we're not making it up as we go along we if we don't stick to this and we get pulled up about it we get our we get our knuckles wrapped okay so the big the big argument comparable versus income capitalized valuations or, or investment valuations which which to use and when bricks and mortar versus commercial valuations is sometimes how they're referred to. Um, never use bricks and mortar when, you, when you're talking to a valuer, you just sound like you don't know what you're talking about. Um, bricks and mortar is mainly used for um, reinstatement valuations. So, you know, when you, when you actually sort of got to rebuild the, the entire physical property, uh, if it's been damaged or destroyed or what have you, a bricks and mortar valuation is, is mainly what, what that refers to. Um, it's a comparable valuation, okay. Um, and again, commercial valuations, that's an investment style valuation methodology. So, yeah, there you go. I've already said it. Very, very bad terminology and potentially confusing. So, in, uh, investment valuations, income capitalized valuations, it's not just... So, th this is from a few years ago, and I think most people have got past this now. Um, in terms of understanding, it's not just locks on doors, um, ensuite bathrooms, fancy colour schemes, coloured lights, or even how much you've spent on the property. It's that that it is such a small, minuscule part of obtaining an income capitalised valuation, a yield valuation. Um, but that's that's very much not it. I, I think most people have sort of got wrapped their head around that now. Certainly. You know, when, when you look on Facebook forums, which I've been doing for more than I care, you know, longer than I care to admit, the the conversation has moved on and, and evolved to a, to a sufficient degree. Whereas five years ago, you know, as a valuer, you were banging your head on the door saying, "What well, these people are just bloody idiots. Um, you know, why, why are they investing the hard earned money in, in HMOs when they just blatantly don't know anything about it? Um, Whereas now, you know, people understand this, but they're not quite get, still getting the point of where we arrive at, how we, um, how we definitively come to doing a yield valuation or, and why some people are sometimes disappointed when they receive a comparable valuation. So that makes us very, very angry bunnies. So what does, why do, why do we do income uh, income capitalized investment valuations. All HMOs are not created equal. So I'm going to ask a question there now. What 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 do people think are the main factors in ob in de definitively obtaining an investment valuation? Is it is it if each room's got a torn on suite? Well, I've already said that's not the case. No. Is it number of rooms? You need to go go a step further than than the number of rooms. What what happens when you get when you do get to a certain number of rooms? Over six, is it when it becomes too generous and? Yep. Okay, so that's one thing. Article four. Yep, that's two. There's one more. Okay, let's have a look. Licensing. So Article 4, planning, sui generis planning, and licensing. Okay, now the, the sui generis planning and Article 4 are both planning related. Okay, what these three things do, now it doesn't necessarily have to be all three. If you get all, if you've got all three, then you uh, the um, the HMO valuation guidance note that we referred to earlier says that a valuer pretty much ought to be giving you a an investment valuation, and, and quite frankly, they're going to have to sort of work hard to to suggest why they haven't done that. Um, the so the what these are okay. There's a, there's a, to sort of zoom out a little bit. These are barriers to entry. Okay, they are supply side limitations. To talk, to talk about it from an economic standpoint, okay? 
So when you, when you have a barrier to entry, it means that the, the guy next door or, or you know, the, the, uh, another investor can't just do what you're wanting to do or what you've done without having to jump through a significant number of hoops first. Okay. So licensing is, is at least the easiest to overcome um, when, when it comes to this little triangle. Licensing is a relative matter of fact. Your, your, your bedroom is either big enough or it ain't. It's either six, you know, if it's 6.5, one square meters, or, you know, I mean, in Doncaster, where I've got some houses, it's, it's 10 square meters. Um, if it ain't that size, it ain't that size. It's, you're just not going to get that, that room signed off as a bedroom. Uh, you know, number, you know, and, and there's a whole, obviously a whole host of different things, you know, um, that each council ha puts in place for, for its licensing requirements. So be that bedroom size, uh, amount of kitchen space per occupant, um, you know, number of bedrooms per occupant, etc. Uh, sorry, number of bathrooms per occupant, the, the type of fire alarm you've got, all those sorts of things, but they are very matter of fact. Once you, you can, you, you can install them in your property and then you tick the box and you get your license, you know, you get the piece of paper handed to you saying you have got a license for this property. So having a license by itself doesn't necessarily sort of, you know, mean that you're going to get an income valuation. In fact, it's probably the easiest for a valuer to disregard. Um, the next one is sui generis planning in terms of its difficulty. So, you know, obviously that means you're probably going to have a physically large HMO for a start. Obviously you can't have a small, um, a, a, you know, a small eight bed property. So what, what it means is that because um, residential properties are, are under C3 in the planning category, so that's a C3 dwelling house, what you're doing is you're moving it out of that planning category into a completely different planning category. Okay, and the argument then is, uh, well, it's it's effectively a different, it's a different beast. It's a di you know, it, it's a different planning. You know, it's, it's in a different planning class to residential houses, and therefore it's it's difficult to argue that it should be compared to other houses because it's because it's just not. So when you've got sui generis planning and a license then we start to move into the realm of okay should you know should this be done as an investment valuation um, however as i mentioned before the barrier to entry is not that difficult you know getting planning it's a big thing to some people but in practical terms it's you know pr pr if there's no article four in place you can just apply for planning again providing your property is physically big enough it's not a big, you know, it's not a big scary thing to to apply for planning. I do it, for, you know, for myself on on all my development projects. And I'm not a planner. I'm not an architect. Um, you know, I just know how to how to put things forward. Now you can pay planners and architects if if you feel, you know, if you don't feel your skill set is sufficiently matched to doing that. But it's not it's not a massive hurdle to jump over. It's the it's a hurdle and it's there, but it's not overcomable. Oh, it's not insurmountable, should I say? Um, so that's where the Article Four really does come into play. Um, and what the Article Four is, obviously, that really does stop a lot of people getting planning permission, because the plan the planners have said, right, well, okay, well, in in this area, be it you know an entire town centre or or a zone within you know within a town, we're going to really limit HMOs in this part of the world, and therefore from a supply side point of view that stops people other people creating that product and therefore it puts a premium on that product because if you've got you know if anybody if, if every, every tom dick and harry can do you know can, can create the same thing then uh, the, there's only ever going to be a certain level of demand for these things so if the supply can just keep going up and up so, uh, sorry it goes like that the supply curve so if the supply goes up price goes down and therefore, you know, you, you're going to struggle to uh, struggle to get high valuations. So that's where Article Four really does help an you know an HMO property investor. The best way to look at it is the alternative investment next door or stroke down the road. And I've sort of hinted at this a few times on this slide. If I, as a as a developer, buy a house, turn it into an HMO, 
can you as as my competitor do the same next door for you know just just as easy as me and if you can why would my hmo my ready-made hmo my beautiful you know hmo that i'm trying to sell to an investor why would that command a premium because that's what most people are trying to achieve and trying to demonstrate to a valuer is that their hmo commands a premium over and above buying a house renovating it and just collecting the rent so if it costs 100 grand to buy a house and 50 grand to renovate it okay you've spent 150 grand what's to stop me doing that why should your house be worth 250 okay so if you're if you're suggesting that it's you know that it's worth 50 if it's a five bedroomed house and just to talk about it very crudely if, if you're suggesting it should be worth 50,000 pound a bedroom that's 250,000 pounds but i can buy a, i can buy a house down the street for 100 spend 50 on it and I'm a hundred grand quick, you know, I'm hundred grand in my back pocket. I'm going to buy a Ferrari to do my inspections in. So, the, so this is where these supply side limitations help the property investor and, and basically enable you to demonstrate to a valuer that your, your property commands a premium and that you should be getting an income capitalized valuation. Any questions? Any, any, and anything I've not explained very well there. Yeah, I've got a question, Ryan. That's all right. Um, something we've come across quite a bit is rent roll down valuations. So that's where the value has gone and found a poor quality um, HMO and said, even though you're commanding a high room, room rate at the moment, we don't think it's sustainable. So therefore, we've gone and found a poorer quality HMO and use that as rent comparable. Mm -hmm. And something that I was told was valuers don't like to value a property so high if, as you said, all the other properties on the right on that street, if their if their top bricks and mortar valuation is 250 and your rent roll valuation is 400, they'll kind of try and massage the rent roll to make it reduce. What do you what do you think about that? I'll answer that question in a couple of slides. Okay. Um, there, there, there is some there almost as if I've thought about this presentation. Um, that uh, that's that's going to be answered shortly. Cool. All right. So, um, any any more? Just uh, just while I put that that question on hold. Uh, sorry, I can't see, I can't quite see your name. Um, but any more on, on or moving on? Okay. Right. So, if, if this presentation is being recorded, isn't it, uh, Paul? Yes, me. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'll leave this up here just for a few seconds, just to give it people time to sort of press pause. This is this is a direct quote from the valuation buy to let property uh, HMO guidance note from the RICS. Okay. Um, if you download it, you can just read the whole thing at, at your own leisure. Uh, some some lovely bedtime reading, um, but that 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 summarises after me blabbering on for the last ten minutes on the last slide. Um, that summarises quite succinctly the what we as valuers should be looking for um so i'll move on just because you can you can go back and, and read it at your leisure and like i say there's there's obviously as you can see it's section 4.4.1 so there is context to that paragraph as well so you know there's bits before it and bits after it which which sort of pad it out and, and make it you know a bit more meat on the bones so to speak so to actually answer your question, there, that, that's the answer. Comparables, comparables, comparables. We as valuers must put comparables in valuations. It's a mandatory rule, okay, within when we're doing valuations. In the olden days, and this is way before my time, I'm talking, you know, 1980s, 1990s, the valuer was right. 
the chartered surveyor was a chartered surveyor and he bloody knew his thing. And he, you know, when he said the property was worth 300,000 pounds, it was bloody well worth it because he'd said so. Um, that's not the case anymore. We have to justify out of our backside why we've arrived at a certain valuation. And the start of that is comparables. So when we, when we do evaluation, we have to say, right, we've got these normally minimum as a minimum three so three rental comparables and three uh, investment comparables and then we have to work up or down from that now the the, the problem with hmos in in this in, in this market and certainly for the last sort of five or six seven years is the one upmanship and that's that's a problem for valuers in the HMO, the quality of HMO, you know, up to, you know, say 15 years ago, HMOs were pretty shit. Okay. Just across the board, if you lived in an HMO, you were probably on benefits up until about 15 years ago or, or a student. That, that was the only thing. Now there's a lot more HMOs and the, the quality of them, and, you know, even I've only been doing them 10 years, and the, but the quality has just risen and risen and risen and risen. The problem valuers have is when somebody uh, when somebody has a, a such a, you know such a superior product, then it's hard to just it's hard for us to to get the comparables to justify that as the market rent. Now, just because it's the passing rent, you know, does, doesn't it's hard. You know, we still have to justify it using comparables. Um, and if you're if you're commanding fifteen pound per week per room, above the above anything else in in the town, it, it's hard. You know, because at the end of the day, we we're, we're the ones that get hit from our PI cover. If we if it's you know if the borrower cocks up, okay, you can walk away and all right, you know, you'll have some financial problems, but you know you make yourself bankrupt and and you walk away from it scot free effectively but we've still got to earn a living as valuers. And therefore we have to be able to justify everything. And if, if, you're, if the property that, you're, that you've done is, is so much higher than you know, most of the things in the market, and we can't, if we can't justify it, then quite frankly, we will be conservative. I'm sorry to shatter that dream. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not Simon Zucci or the progressive guys and you know, yeah, yeah, you're definitely going to get 50 pounds a week more and it's going to be dead easy or, or the value will just tick it off. Not like that. Any value who, who knows what he's doing will, you know, and, and is at least moderately concerned about his PI cover, okay, will, will understand that he, he or she has to justify things. And that goes with the yields as well. So if you've got a property that's sold at 10, you know, 10 percent net rent, we have to be able to justify why you're wanting nine percent, okay? And if if we can't, then we won't. You know, we're not here to make you guys money, unfortunately. Again, I'm gonna pop that bubble. It's not happening. If there are, if there are genuinely other comparables out there, so this is where your valuation packs come in handy. Okay, I, I'm I'm always happy to receive valuation packs. It does it does the work for me. You know, we don't get a massive amount of money for for doing these valuations, uh, despite what people think, because there's a lot of middlemen. You know, there's a lot of uh, uh, panel managers and all that sort of thing who who take a big old cut uh, from the price that you pay. So you know, w we might get a thousand pounds for a couple. You know, it's a couple of days' work. Um, it's not a it's not a great sum of money by the time we've paid our tax on it and everything, um, so it, it cuts out a lot of work for us. And also, it, it, you know, there's only so many portals where people publish sold HMOs, so getting comparables is hard, and you really have to do you know you 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 have to do a lot of legwork. So if you if you guys can do the valuation packs and you can say, oh look, you know that property sold round the corner um, uh, on a you know on a nine percent net yield then that's great. Um, so that's what you need to do. You, do. you really do need to sort of do your homework um, for the value effectively and, and try and dig out those, um, those comparables. Oh, look, there we go, just to really hit it home. So yields. Does, does anyone know what a yield is? 
when, when, when we talk about value, you know, when we talk about v yields in, in valuations, is, is anyone au fait with it or is it a bit of a... No? Okay. So, so to explain it then, the yield, the yield is, is a shortened way of saying the all risks yield. Okay. And it's basically how risky the investment is. And this is not this does not apply to HMOs, as is demonstrated on this little chart that I've uh, I may have pinched from the internet. Um, so at the green end, if I'm pointing, the, am I pointing the right way? Green end? No, green end. Yeah. So at the green end, that is no risk. Okay. If you've got cash under your mattress, shy of somebody coming in and you know someone coming in and nicking it. Um, that is the safest form of investment. Okay, cash. Will, the only the only way you will lose money on cash is is by inflation erosion. Okay, if you've got cash in the bank up to is it eighty five grand or eighty grand in in any one institution, um, I can't remember what. The, but it's it's basically it's safe. And if you, if you put eighty grand in cash in in, in Lloyd's Bank, it's it's guaranteed by the government. Okay. Now you're going to lose money on it over over the years, effectively, because you know the inflation will erode how much it's worth. Okay, but it's fairly safe. So moving up from that this way, um, you've got government gilt. Okay, so that that is the the old-fashioned gilt edge bond. It's a bond. Um, so that's where you give the government a hundred pounds or multiples thereof of your money, and you might get one percent a year maybe 2% if you go, if you invest in, in some, some international bonds um, for, you know, slightly more, you know, slightly, slightly less sort of salubrious countries, um, you know, maybe some Eastern European countries and what have you. Uh, but, you know, the UK, France, Germany, you know, we all have extremely low bond rates and therefore you're going to get a fairly, fairly secure, but fairly low return. So move, moving up slightly, you know, so then we have the, the middle bit of, uh, of residential property. So these are, you know, relative, relatively risky, but if you've got a traditional buy to let, you know, it's, it's the, the bond market sees it as relatively sort of middle risk. Um, and then moving all the way up to, you know, to, to commodities, oil, gold, you know, where, where the price just is like, you know, it's like, like it's a bit erratic and, you know, it can be all over the place from you know, nine o'clock to 10 past nine in the morning. Um, you, know, you can be up and down all over the place and then all the way through to emerging stock markets. So that's, you know, like some African countries, uh, you know, maybe some, some Asian countries where, you know, or, or South American countries where things just aren't as, you know, aren't as long standing as, as the, you know, the, the London stock exchange or the NASDAQ or the S and P 500, um, all those things that they're, they're, you know, they're, they're further down, sorry, uh, down the, the, the risk register. Um, where do HMOs sit on there? I would suggest it's around the sort of the orangey red sort of position. Okay, that's uh, that's generally accepted as as their their risk register. You know, you, they're relatively management intensive. Um, you know, you, you can have often have a, a good number of problems dealing with them relative relative to these, because quite frankly. The, the whole point of, of looking at yields is this is the alternative as to where you guys can invest your cash. Okay. So you, you, if you've got a hundred grand in cash, in, in cash, for example, you can do any of these. Okay. You don't have to go and buy a, a property and then turn it into an HMO. This is your alternative, depending on how risky you want to be. If you want to be dead safe, like my nan, for example, then you put it in get in cash and and so you know and some savings accounts, which is super duper safe. You're going to be earn bugger all from it. That that's your choice. The alternative is you put it in some you know some emerging stock markets, and you might lose a good proportion of your money, but then you may have one or two winners, which make it all all worthwhile. Um, and and so what what we have to understand as valuers is you know how risky is this investment. Ryan, just a quick one before we move on. Why is um, commercial property safer than residential property, just out of interest? Um, the types of leases that commercial, commercial tenants will typically sign up to, 
Um, so they more often than not the full repair and insuring leases. Okay, um, so that means the tenant is responsible for for dealing with all the uh, all the repairs, all the insurance, all that sort of thing. Um, they're longer leases as well. Um, t again, it, it depends which type of which you know which, which type of commercial tenant you've got. But if you've got screw fix, for example, as a tenant, would you rather have screw fix or a HMO tenant? Yeah, I get you. Screw fix, I'll do it. Who's who's definitely going to pay your rent at the end of every quarter? Screw fix. That's your answer. Yeah. So again, this is not an absolute. It's 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 a, it's a spectrum. So if you look at screw fix versus, I don't know, W H Smiths maybe. Which one would you prefer for those two? W H Smith, do not screw fix. Yeah, screw fix because W H Smith are a retailer, and retailers are having a torrid time at the minute. Um, you know, lots of shops closing, uh, full changes in business models, that sort of thing. You know, everything's going online now. Uh, if if it were me, all of the things being equal, I'd choose screw fix. You know, I, I've I've just been to screw fix earlier today, and the queue was out the door. You know, I bet when even when lockdown finishes. If I walk into the WH Smiths in Meadowhall in Sheffield, might be, you know, there'll be a decent number of customers in, but it won't be packed out. Um, so it, it, it's it, this is not a, obviously this is not just an absolute, but it's it's yeah. it's a spectrum. Yeah. So what what we what we have to do as valuers is when we're valuing anything is we have to say well you know a what do the accounts look like? On if it's if it's for a commercial property, we have to look at the accounts and and. Quite frankly, we'll do an Experian credit check, um, see what the, see how the business is performing, uh, or, or maybe a Dun and Bradstreet check if if we're feeling a bit flush uh, and fancy spending twenty five pounds on them. Um, and and we also have to look at the the underlying business and and how that business is performing in in the economy. Um, and HMO tenants, to to put it back into the context of this presentation. HMO tenants just aren't as aren't as good a quality as commercial tenants. You know, as as, as, as business, then they're not businesses. They are, you know, they can be at least relatively transient. Uh, you know, a lot of them could just move up, you know, up and off, do a midnight flit. Yeah. Uh, the the landlord is broadly speaking responsible for all the repairs. Um, so that that's why. Perfect. Thank you. And then just. Sorry, before we move on, there's a question there for you from Rob. Where are the portals for sold HMOs? Um, CoStar is one of them. Um, and I can see people writing this down. You need to get your checkbooks out, guys. It's, uh, it's a good few thousand pounds a month um, to subscribe to CoStar. Um, EIG isn't bad. Uh, that's uh, Estates Interactive Group, I think. Um, can't remember what it stands for, if I'm honest. EIG, it's an auction website, basically. Um, again, subscription. It's not quite as expensive. It's, it's about £1,000 a year, I think. Um, so a lot more modest. Um, and also, there's a, there's a new one. Um, it, it's a, it used to be just a piece of mapping software. It's called Nimbus, uh, like, the, like the balloon. Um, Nimbus again. It's it's paid, it's paid for subscription. I confess I don't know how much that is. Nimbus is a really nice tool. Um, just anyway, especially if you're doing any sorts of de uh, developments, um, your development sites, because the, there's a function on it where you can you can mess around and, and sort of find who owns pieces of land without having to buy the titles. Um, which you know if it it works if you're trying to piece together parcels of land. Or also understand how big pieces of land are, um, and there's a whole host of various functions on it that I don't use just because I don't need to. But there's, there's, you know, there's, there's other experts. So I think there's, there's a couple of people on on some of the Facebook forums who who use Nimbus regularly, um, who will probably know more about it than I ever care to. Um, but th those three, um, and then it's just, you know, it's it's just other agents, just ringing the agents up, you know, and, and finding out who's who's sold. Um, who sold bits? Uh, perfect. Thanks, mate. All right. 
so yields and years purchase. What is years years purchase and how does it relate to the yield? So everyone knows about the multiplication factor. Okay, so if I've got my uh, if I've got my my net my my rents, be it gross or net rents, and I times it by ten, then I multiply it by ten. That's my multiplication factor. The technical name for that is the YP, the year's purchase. Okay, um, and it's basically the amount of years it would take you to buy the property using cash, uh, based off the rent. So if the rent's ten thousand pound a year, and you've got a YP of ten. The, the the valuation will be a hundred thousand pounds and it's basically a hundred thousand pound is is divided into ten so it's going to take you ten years to buy that property using using the rent of ten thousand using cash only okay so how many years it's going to take you it's like your payback period basically and so there we go ten percent so a ten percent yield is ten yp a hundred divided by ten okay a 9% yield, so in yields, lower is better. Okay, everyone, th everyone thinks that getting a better, the higher yield is, is better, which broadly speaking is correct. But in valuations, you want a lower yield because a lower yield will give you a higher capitalization rate, a, high, a higher end figure, okay? And you'll see that in, in a few minutes when I, when I go onto the actual number crunching. Um, So the, the yield and the YP, of the, uh, the multiplication factor, are the inverse of each other. So if you look at the 9% the one, so, that's the, the, so if you've got a 9% yield, that would be an 11.1 YP. So that would be, if you've got your 10,000 pound rent, that would, you would multiply that by 11.1 to give you a, a, a capital value of 110,000 and check in a bit of change. So lowering the yield by 1% increases that, that valuation by £10,000. Okay. So I've given the answer away. What's the best to high or low, or low yield? It's a low yield, and we'll see why in a minute. So an example. So what we do when we're actually doing HMO evaluations is... Again, this, this may change market to market, so don't take, don't take this as an absolute definitive. There are some markets, um, especially student areas, um, Cambridge and, and Sheffield, for example, uh, I know that you don't deduct the, um, and you don't deduct anything, you just work off gross rents when you're doing, when valuers are doing valuations. Um, so don't take this as an, as an absolute, but broadly speaking, what we do is we get the market rent. So again, that might be 10 rooms at hundred pound a week for 52 weeks a year. Okay, so that's 52 grand. Less the deductions. So that's your, your gas, your electric, your council tax, your broadband, anything else that the landlord will, will typically be obliged to pay for. It may be, um, it, it may be the, some sort of management as well. So anything that the landlord is obliged to pay for, okay. You capitalize the rents using your yield. Okay, so this example, eight rooms at 100 pound a week gross gives you a 41 and a bit grand market rent. Minus a nice easy 10,000 pound in utilities, okay. So that's your adjusted net rent at a 10% yield after rounding is 315,000 pound. Okay. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna tweak, just remember that valuation. Oh, where have I gone? There we go. Just sort of, just put that, that valuation in your head. And what we're gonna do now is mess around with it and see how making little changes. Yeah, I'll be done in a minute. Oh. Um, how making little changes can massively affect that bottom line number of 315. So the variables in that, in that above valuation was the rent per room, the amount of deductions and the yield. Okay. They're the three things that we can mess with. Basically, we can't mess with the number of rooms. That's a fact, providing you've got your, um, 
uh, you know, providing you've got your license for H for four eight HMO rooms, then we're going to value eight rooms for you. That's 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 not that you can't mess with that. So, in the last one, was it a hundred pound a week? Yeah. So, you managed to convince the valuer that the rent is one hundred and five pound a week because that's what you're getting, and there's other comparables that that can justify that, or at least your property is sufficiently good over and above the over and above over and above the comparables that it's justifiable to get one hundred and five pound a week. That's your market rent. You also tell him that, as a matter of fact, you're only paying eight thousand pound in utilities because you've shopped around mega mega hard, um, which any competent landlord should be doing, and you know you've got your gas and electric at a super low rate. Um, you know the council tax is cheap, and you're self managing, uh, which is you know which is doable. So you're only paying eight grand in utilities and voids. So that's your adjusted net rent. You also managed to find a couple of decent sales comparables where the yield isn't 10%, it's 9.5%. Okay. So that 315,000, you've managed to bag yourself an extra 60 grand on, on your valuation. So let's go the other way. The valuer is feeling a little bit depressed this, this morning and only thinks that your rooms are worth £95 a week. He also thinks, well, you know, I, I think that you know people ought to be managing it um, because it's a big HMO and, you know, you probably need some specialist management in place. And, uh, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think that the... Uh, the utilities ought to be only eight thousand pound, and that is going to be a bit more, a bit, you know, a bit more sort of harsh on on the amount of voids that you that you're likely to obtain. So instantly, you can see a give or take a twelve thousand pound difference just in just in your rents. Okay. He also thinks that the yield ought to be ten and a half percent. So we've moved out one percent in your yield. And that's the difference. Okay, so remember that we, we originally, we started with relatively sort of square numbers, basically. So, you know, um, £100 a week, 10% yield, £10,000 deduction, and we ended up with £315,000. Okay, so we've, we've gone from 315 in the middle, potentially all the way up to 375, all the way down to 260. It's the same property. Okay. But the value hasn't either has or hasn't been convinced of how good or otherwise it is, and this is why it's important. If you keep, even if you just do the rents all the way down, all the, all the same, and and the um, and the deductions. So even if you stay with the original, I can't remember what it was. Da, 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 thirty-one and a half grand. So if you stick with that original, thirty-one and a half grand, and just mess around with the yield. It can it can make, you know mean a big difference, not quite as pronounced as that because obviously I've I've sort of changed everything positively or negatively, but this is where you as as borrowers effectively have to, have to be aware of the things that can change in the valuation, and if you can go out there and find some good good investment yield comparables, okay, that suggest that properties are sell are selling. Because again, this is this is going back to the comparables um, thing. The properties have to have sold. There has to be an active market for HMO properties. Okay, if you're out in the middle of Timbuktu somewhere and nobody's buying ready-made HMOs, you ain't going to get an investment compar. You, know, you, you can have planning for it. You can have, you know, it can be in an Article Four area for some reason, and you, and you can have a license. But if the comparables aren't there, the value work will not do you a favor because it's not worth his pi cover you need to make sure that you go out there and, and find the comparables okay they're, they're sometimes quite hard to come across but if you're in the market you, you know you, you're going to have at least a decent idea and you can you know just speak to him nicely i'm saying him him or her um you know speak to him or her nicely and 
uh, and just put forward the fact that you know properties are selling you know and this is you know these are properties that have transacted and that's the important thing they can't be on the market for sale doesn't matter they've got to have actually completed and transacted okay because that means cash has changed hands okay i, I the whole for sale thing is is you know crazy some people say oh you know is that property is on the market for you know eight percent yield well you know i i could ask for a billion pounds for the ha for my house for the house i live in i'm not going to sell it for a billion pounds i can tell you i can put it on the market for a billion pound next week you know, i can ask my pal to put it on right move it won't sell um and that's why for sale properties aren't aren't good comparables they need to have actually sold Okay. And there's just a couple of questions there if you've got time, Ryan. So um first one's from Rob. What percentage do you deduct for expenses on your HMO valuations? You, right. Any decent valuer shouldn't just be deducting a percentage, it should be an, a numerical figure. You, you, deducting twenty percent or twenty-five percent, they shouldn't be doing that. That's a shit way of doing valuations because the the amount of just talking about utilities, for example, just as just as, a, as an easy start for 10. I don't know if, if anyone's got multiple HMOs. And if, if you've got some, let's say four or five bed HMOs and some 10 bed HMOs, I'll guarantee that the the uh, the actual, you know, ex taking away, putting to one, to one side your management costs for a minute, utilities costs aren't that different between one and the other. Your council tax will broadly be the same, you know, may, maybe a hundred quid or so more expensive for the bigger property. Um, and again, utilities are, are going to be a bit more expensive, but not massively more expensive. So you, you get economies of scale on, on your bigger properties. And therefore, to, to, to deduct, say, 25% from a five bed HMO may, may, may ultimately be reasonable. But to deduct 25% from a 10 bed HMO would probably be over the top because what you're doing is you, do, you end up deducting numerically a very large figure because you've got, you know, you've got 10 rooms. Okay, so you've got twice as many rooms as, as, your, as your other property, but you can't just, you, you can't, your council tax, for example, that council tax is divided into 10 divisions effectively rather than five. Um, so, the valuer should technically be, be doing a, a numerical deduction, i.e., you know, taking 2,000, uh, you know, again, this is where you, you should be in a position to sort of to convince the valuer, hopefully, that, you know, look, these are my actual bills. Not, don't just deduct 25% off because that's the easy thing to do. You know, the, the, so I'm paying 2,000 pounds a year in gas. I'm paying two and a half thousand pounds a year in electric and I've shopped around because you know again that's what a reasonably competent landlord does you don't have to be Martin Lewis money saving expert but you, you at least have to you know you at least have to sort of show that you're you're moderate you're moderately competent and the, this these are actions that other moderately competent investors take yeah perfect thank you mate and then um, Louise is asking Presumably, the yield figure will vary widely across regions. How can we guesstimate what yield the valuer will work on? Don't. Don't guesstimate. Go out there and find compare Before you buy a property, okay, when, you, when you're out there looking for HMOs to put offer or, your, or properties to put offers in on, you need to know the end valuation that you, that you should expect. Um, that this is not, you know, you're investing lots of your time and money in, in these projects. Okay. You shouldn't be guesstimating. You should know, broadly speaking, the figure that you will arrive at come the end of the development. Okay. So that means as well as looking for properties to buy, you need to look at properties that have sold. And what that will do is that it will allow you to, to be knowledgeable in a position and say, right, if I buy this property for X and add value to it, this is, you know, this is the figure that I'm going to arrive at come the end of the project. And I can back that up with evidence, comparables, okay, using 123 Acacia Avenue, 79 Park Street, you know, all
or these properties have sold for, for you know, they, they had this much rent, you know, they're this many rooms that rented at hundred pounds a week and they sold for a 10% yield, you know, 70, 75 Park Street sold at 9.82% net yield. You need to do that research beforehand. You shouldn't be putting your finger in the air because it's a, it's a bloody lot of money that you're investing in either your own or if, if you're using like bridging finance or anything. You know, you don't want to be in, be in a position where you get a valuation back and you're thinking, oh shit, I didn't know that. You know, that, that, that's, that, that's just blown, you know, my life savings out of the water. Um, you know, I've got three other properties in legals and I'm going to have to pull them and waste loads of fees. Um, yeah, do, do your research before you buy. That's, that's the thing. You, um, yeah, don't buy and then, and then do your research. That's the last thing you want to do. Thanks, man. So a couple of things that get value is knocked off and it especially pisses me off. I'm going to get that fixed. So I turn up at evaluation and I'm in my suit and tie, um, God forbid. And I, I, I'm thinking, okay, you know, I, I walk out. Um, ah, I just turn into a big angry penguin. And you turn up at this and you think, Jesus Christ, what is this guy for real? You know, he's telling me this, this property is everything, you know, everything in the bag of chips. And it looks like a gypsy caravan site. You know, it, it, it looks like, it just looks like trash. You're not going to get a good valuation if, if a valuer turns up to that. I have a, I have a sort of a three phase uh, sort of advancement policy when I, when it comes to my valuations and when I'm advising clients. If, you, if you're physically renovating the property and you're getting the property renovated, you know, fairly sharpish af, after you, uh, you know, upon finishing the renovations, this doesn't quite apply so much. But if you've got a property that, you know, an HMO that's been running for a while, okay, you need to go a month before, you, you need to go a month before the value is turning up, okay? Valuers don't just turn up out of the blue. You expect them to come on a certain day. And therefore it's not, you are, you know, in advance, you'll know before the valuer that the value was coming. Okay, it's not a shock. So you've got time to prepare. And these are things that you should be doing. So you want to go a month before the value was due to come broadly. And go and stand, stay in the property for a few hours and understand from the tenants what's what's broke. You know, are the tenants constantly taking the, 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 the door closers off the hinges, for example, tell them to stop doing it? Has there been a leak in the shower? And it's come through and okay, you may have fixed the leak, but now there's a big brown stain on the ceiling. Right, note, I need to go and get some ceiling paint. Okay, is, is, the, is the carpet in the entrance hall a bit shabby? Right, no, get carpet contractor to come. There are you know, lots and lots of these little jobs. The valuer will probably notice them. Okay, and this is what I'm trying to get across. So go a week, go a month before and, and get just basically draw a list up. Obviously fix any minor problems that you can if you've got your toolbox to hand, if that's your thing. Alternatively, just go and get a list of stuff that needs fixing. Then go a week before and actually do the jobs. Or, you know, it depends how big the jobs are. You may, may, may need to go a couple of weeks before. Um, then go the day before and clean the property, deep clean. Okay. Again, a valuer won't give you a tip top valuation. If he walks into a house that stinks of chips, just, just valuers are people. And if we feel we're walking into a premium product that's been looked after, it's been cared for, you know, there's no, there's no mess everywhere. It's just little things that add to our certainty and to our, confidence that we're going to you know that, that we can put that extra 25 grand on the valuation uh, and not be scared that it's going to come back to bite us in the arse in a couple of years time um and then the day before turn up a couple of hours before you know don't be late to the valuation um you know turn up a couple of hours before because if something's happened from the day before you probably want to try and get that fixed before you know obviously if it's a, if it's a catastrophic leak then there's nothing you can do uh, but, you know, put the bins out or, you know, tidy up, go to, go to the local dump it site in your car and get rid, get rid of the black bags. 
Um, all these little things. Again, we need confidence that we're doing valuations on nice assets, you know, safe assets. And if we do, we'll put that we'll put that yield down quarter of a half percent. Makes a big difference. Trust me. You know that I've I've that's that's a that's a photo of mine. I've turned up to that. Admittedly, it wasn't an HMO. Do you think they got a good valuation? Nobody, nobody's nodding the head. Okay, you get the picture. Don't let me see that. Uh, me uh, or any other valuer walks in to see that. You just, you're just going to get a big no. It's, it's, you, you're going to be, you are going to be disappointed with the, with the evaluation that you receive. That's what we want to walk into. Admittedly, obviously, that's that, that's just a photo off the internet. I confess, um, but you know, that to me gives me confidence. That gives me the 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 impression that okay, this is a well managed, well run property. Um, you know, I'm happy to put that as a uh, as a decent valuation. So, pens and papers at the ready. You become the valuer, so that this this valuation is an art and a science. It's not a, it's not an absolute perfect mathematical. You know, one plus one equals two. Okay, there's a there's a bit of artistic license in it, and it's 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 not it's not an easy job. Um, it's it's not exactly difficult either, but you know it's. Uh, it's not something where you can absolutely guarantee. And, and what I'm about to show to you is you're all, going, you're all now going to work with the same facts I'm about to present to you. And I want you to scratch down on if you've got it, a piece of paper. And then when I ask you to hold it up to the screen, okay, or, or you can ping Paul your, your answers. And I'm going to show you that the, the, they will, if all things work out, you, you'll see why I'm doing this in a minute. Okay, so the scenario. It's an HMO in a, in a university town with seven bedrooms. Okay, I'll, um, I'll go back through any of this if, 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 if anyone sort of forgets. It's in modest condition, you know, typical of seven grubby lads living together, but it's not bad. No en suites, but there's three communal bathrooms, one on each floor. No article, no article four direction, but, but it does have sui generis planning and licensing is in place and complied with, etc. There you go. Okay, so assume that everything is all tickety boo from a, a, a licensing and, and mandatory point of view. The passing rent is £35,000 per annum. That's £100 per room per week for a 50-week period. And the tenants are responsible for all the bills. So remember, it's, in a, it's, in a, um, it's a university property, so they're students, and therefore they won't have to pay council tax, etc. Comparable. <coughs> oh, dear me. Sorry. They are comparables that you've got to work with. Okay. Don't make any comparables up. The, this is the, this is the hand you've been dealt. You've you've had a rough time, and you can only find three comparables. So you've got the one on the same street. It's in It's got significantly superior quality to the subject. It's newly renovated, full on suites, and it's got little mini kitchenettes in each room. And the rent passing is one hundred and thirty pound a week for fifty weeks. <clears throat> You've got another prop, another comparable across town, equity, although it's equidistant to the university campus. It's a similar, maybe even marginally inferior to the subject property, and that's ninety-five pound a week for fifty-two weeks of the year. Okay, and then you've got another property half a mile away, basically identical, and it's only four bathrooms with two bedrooms. Uh, sorry, yeah, four bedrooms and two bathrooms, and that's ninety-five pound a week, but only for forty-eight weeks of the year. Okay. So <clears throat> these these are your sales comparables. You've got next door to the subject property. It sold ten weeks ago. 
it's, although it's not used as a HMO, it's the same size as, as, as the subject, and that's sold for 300 grand. You've got another property a few roads away. It's an inferior, oh, hello, sorry. Um, it's an inferior quite, um, quality to the subject. It sold earlier this year. It's a nine bed HMO producing 40 and a half thousand pounds. And it sold for 9.75 gross initial yield, which make, makes it sell at 415,000. And there's another property across town, superior to the subject, sold in early 2018 via auction. And it's a seven bed HMO, same as the subject, also producing 35 grand. And that sold for 437 representing an 8% gross yield. So uh, just, to, just to sort of fill you in, guys, I've, I've took a couple of slides out from a previous valuation I've done. The gross yield is basically just taking the gross rent and dividing it by that yield. Okay, so you, we haven't taken any, um, any costs off. Okay. So what I want you to do is have a think about it for a couple of minutes. How, what would you value this property at? So not what, not what you'd like it to value at as an investor, you're a valuer, you're a chartered surveyor for the, for the purpose of this exercise. What would you value the property at? So I'll go back, they're the facts. So you've got 35 grand a year over a 50 week period. If anyone wants me to skip back, back and forth, just sort of shout up. Give me another 10 or 15 seconds. There's no right or wrong answer, but it's just to demonstrate a point. If you're struggling with how to work out your um, your rent your rent to to capitalise it, um, if you want to do it at nine percent, for example, you would just you do do whatever rent you think is applicable divided by 0 0.09. Okay, and that would give you a nine percent yield. Um, if you want to do eight eight and a half percent, it would be divided by 0 0.085. So uh, Rob, Rob's put a guess in there, estimate. Okay. Are we all uh, gone? And so, so everyone ping your, ping your answers to Paul, if you can, if, if that's uh, something you can do. And Paul can, uh, Paul can read them out. He can read his own first, though. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I've, I've personally gone for 380. Okay. And then in the chat box, we've got 364, 380, 375, and 350. Right. That's a fairly tight spread, I've got to say. So th anything from 350 to 380. Um, I'm not going to say what the answer is, because there isn't one. That's the, th that's the point. But what we've got there is effectively a 10% difference, uh, or just shy of 10% of difference between a group of people who have you know, I just, just listened to, to me drone on for the last hour or so. Um, you've all had the same facts. Okay. And the, the margin of spread is, is, you know, give or take about 10%. And this show, this just goes to prove that valuation is not an exact science. It's not one plus one equals two. You've all been dealt the same facts and okay, a couple of people arrived at 380. And you know this is a fairly easy, you know, easy, you know, easy valuation to do uh, the, using these facts. But you know somebody's put three hundred and fifty grand, and somebody's put three eighty. So what that goes to prove is that you know the valuer isn't necessarily wrong when he's got the you know when he comes back with a lower valuation. It just may mean that it, he's he's in his profession his or his or her professional opinion they've just arrived at a different answer 
using the facts that have been given to them. And this is the thing, it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not simple um, and it's, it's not, you know, quite straightforward. You have to go out there and you have to do, you know, look for the, th look for the evidence that backs up, hopefully producing a high evaluation using a, a lower, you know, lower yield comparables. Um, if the valuer is able to sort of work off a small pool of, of comparables that all say 12% yield, okay, then it'll happily work from them. Because what that ultimately means is it means is there's less chance of his professional indemnity insurance getting clobbered. Because if you default in, in 12, 18, 24 months time and the mortgage goes belly up, then the bank can probably just get rid of the property fairly sharpish and, and not lose money, which means that they won't claim against him. And that, that's what we as valuers always have to, have to consider. It's a big thing. You know, PI is, is not cheap. Um, you, can, you can be looking at, to, well, for a sole trader, you can be looking at 10 grand a year plus for, to do bank, you know, to do secured lending valuations. Um, so that effectively means your first sort of 10, 12, 15, maybe even 15 jobs every year are, are free. You know, you've got to pay those out uh, and write them off against, you know, against expenses. That's not including traveling to the place and all your subscriptions that you have to pay to, to get the comparables. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an expensive job. So help yourselves, help the valuer. Um, and hopefully you'll get some good valuations back. Okay. Any questions? I've got a question, Ryan. Yeah. Um, if you had two HMOs, uh, one ran with professionals and one like identical HMOs, one ran with professionals and one on a supported living contract for say 20 years on a commercial lease. How would you, what changes would you make when you're valuing the supported living one? Uh, the supported living pro uh, projects are, are the extraordinarily difficult, difficult to value. I've done a, I've done a few in the past. Um, it's hard to explain in, in a few minutes how you go about valuing them uh, because the underlying, uh, what tends to happen is that they're, they're usually quite small. Is, is that, would that be fair to say that they're not usually eight, nine, 10 bedroomed HMOs? Um, it's got six, uh, they call them service users, but yeah with one um full-time member of staff so there's technically seven people in there yeah so it's under c3b use mm -hmm. but the uh, person that's in there is on 24-hour rolling shifts so that care that person that's providing the care isn't technically living there if you like yeah so as, a, so as a professional hmo it would have been an over but as a professional hmo would have, yeah would have been an over but imagine it was just a seven bed hmo yeah uh, right First of all, it depends who the tenant is, um, because what you what you what you could do is is um, you have to take we, we, you have to take each, there's no broad brush answer to this unfortunately Rob. Um, it's, um, you'd have to take look at each case on its own merits. If you've got a twenty year lease to a you know to a fairly decent company, for example, um, you could capitalise the rent, um, and you know. I've spoke to a couple of valuers who have done that and they just said, right, well, it's a 20 year lease. You know, I've just sort of capitalized the rent using an appropriate yield. So if it's 20 grand a year, they've just said, right, well, you know, that, that particular tenant is, is fairly strong covenant. Um, and therefore I'll capitalize it at 8%. Um, you know, that's 12 and a half times multiple and have done with it. Um, the, the slight issue with, with doing that is that effectively the house is, is a house and that's the underlying asset. Um, and if it's not in an article four area and it, you know, you've not got plan, you've not got planning, um, and you've not got a, a an HMO license, it's effectively a house. Um, well, and I'm so I'm talking about it's gone through planning commission for 10 years. And I, I, sorry, I, I can't hear you. Sorry, the one I'm talking about, it's gone through planning commission for 10 years, so it's had that 
uh, speed in the used cars and bits uh, we've got a license. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. This is this is the thing. It's, it's there's no easy answer to this. Unfortunately, mate. This is a um, it, it's it, it's each case on its on its merits, and you, you have to look at um, you have to look at them. I had one. It was a it was a good while ago. Now it was about four or five years ago, and it had a, a three or five year lease, I think, if I remember rightly. Um, and I ended up doing quite a complex valuation because, effectively, it was quite small as well. I think there were only three uh, three patients or three service users, as the official terminology. So there were three people in there, um, and staff. It was. I think it was the same thing. Is is that there was also a member of staff, sort of, you know, on a, on a rolling basis. So there were four bedrooms, but it was it was a four bed, um, it was a four bed bungalow, um, and the rent was really like super duper high, um, relative to what would be achieved as a, as a family property. Um, but what I did there is I capitalised the rent for for the remainder of the lease. And then defer, deferred it back to what it would be as a house. Deferred the valuation back to what it would be as a house, and what what what's technically called PV that PV that present value is it's complex and not for this forum. Um, yeah, each case on its own merits, mate. is it's a complex area, um, and it, it requires a specialist valuation. I, I don't know if you're asking if you if you're effectively asking me what gets the best valuation. Again, you have to look at. It. You, you have to look at each what each case on its own merits. Cool, thank you. Perfect. Well, um, I believe that's it, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, not a problem. If uh, if anyone's got any questions, just bang them to Paul. Um, I'm I'm sure I've driveled on enough for people this afternoon. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll happily answer any questions. Um, Providing it's not actually, you know, can you know, I've got this property, and can you do me a valuation over WhatsApp? Because um, the answer is no. Unfortunately, you'll have to instruct me formally and then pay me. Um, so uh, yes, the, the amount of people I do ask, get asking me, I've, uh, you know, hypothetically, Ryan, if you had this property, um, and it, and it's hypothetically producing fifty grand a year, and it's hypothetically in Nottingham, um, can you know, what, what would it be worth? And it's like, well, you can really pay me uh, and you can really get a proper valuation. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the only caveat I'd say is that, you know, if you want some sort of, you know, sort of generic advice, that's fine. If you want valuation advice, then, you know, we do, we do, we do have to do things properly uh, as the Red Book states. Um, Perfect. Well, um, mate, thank you so much for your time. Um, that was awesome. Are you okay if I get this uploaded on our YouTube channel? Yep. For the rest of the community, that's great. Well, Mia, thank you very much again, and um, everyone else have a great day. Thanks, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Ryan. Cheers. Thank thanks, you. guys.